<laughs> When's the last time you heard Nelly, huh? Injured. Nice. I feel like I want to slam dunk a basketball right now. We are kicking off a new message series, so this is a great time to be here uh, on this Sunday. Welcome to all our campuses all throughout the metro area. We're super happy to uh, get this started today. We're going to take a look at the heart of a champion, what it takes to be a champion. Now, everybody, I don't know, I, I'm just, maybe for me, uh, for you too, we, we, when we were little, we had superheroes, right, that we liked, like Superman. Uh, uh, my favorite was Batman. I just loved Batman, and there was something about it, a, little, a bat cave, and, and I truly understood, I think it was when Jack Nicholson in the, in the movie said, where does he get those wonderful toys? That was awesome. But there is truly one superhero that captured my imagination as a, as a young kid and glued me to the TV like no other superhero. Now, this may be an obscure superhero for you. For some of you, you may never even have heard of this superhero. But I wanted to introduce you to my favorite superhero of all time. Here we go. Yes. If you don't know that, you're way too young. You probably need to Google it, YouTube it. Uh, that's the beauty of it. Now you can catch up in one um, or two days, probably. So. Underdog is awesome, and uh, and we're all looking for superheroes. Now we have superheroes in the Bible, right? That we gravitate towards. Maybe Moses is for you, a great leader, uh, led the people of Israel out of out of Egypt. Maybe for you, it's Queen Esther who risked everything to save her people. Maybe uh, Jonah who got swallowed by a big fish and then preached up a huge storm to save Nineveh. There's all kinds of superheroes in the Bible that we look towards for faith and for courage and strength. Probably more than any other character that we see in the Bible uh, is a man uh, that exudes incredible courage and strength and leadership. Uh, he's a poet, a songwriter, a warrior. We know him as a king, King David, the second king of the nation of Israel. Now, before we get to David, we want to do a little backstory kind of stuff. And so I want you to uh, hear kind of how this all gets going. 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 5. As Samuel grew old, and now Samuel's the prophet of the nation of Israel. And the way they kind of worked the system there was God was king. Samuel was his spokesman. The prophet was the spokesperson. So God would give instruction to the prophet who would give instruction then to the nation of Israel. So Samuel grew old. He appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. Joel and Abijah, his oldest sons, held court in Beersheba. But they were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes and perverted justice. And again, as we read this story, you're kind of go, man, that sounds familiar. Kind of sounds like politicians. They're greedy for money and power, accepting bribes, perverted justice. Finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter of Samuel. Look, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like the other nations have. Now, the nation of Israel had been on a slow decline from God. And they didn't set out to drift very far from God, but they had. I mean, typically we don't set out to walk away from God. I mean, it's not overnight. It usually is just kind of a slow thing that takes sometimes years where we just, you know, at one time we were in tune, we were listening, we were obeying, we were uh, doing our stuff for God. And then all of a sudden, you know, we look and go, how did I get so far away from him? Well, over the course of the time, we took some missteps and followed different paths. Here's God now, uh, uh, he's instructing Samuel and Samuel's trying his best to pull people back to God and, the, and he appointed his boys to, to oversee uh, some stuff and they were massively corrupt. In fact, one translation says that they just turned aside from God. Again, once again, they, they weren't in complete, I mean, they didn't go from, hey, one time they're super in love with God and now complete rebellion. It, it was just a series of steps of turning aside from God, just a little rebellion. And we don't know why they were rebellious. I, maybe we could blame Samuel, wasn't a good dad, didn't show much attention, wasn't there for their ball games. I don't know what he did to mess up this stuff. You know, we can blame parents. Maybe it was just the boys' choices. They 
Maybe they begin to run with the wrong crowd and listen to some folks and voices and stuff, you know, like, but all of it, but they are messed up. And the elders of the nation of Israel gets together and they confront Samuel and they say, first of all, Samuel, you're old. Now that's age discrimination right there, right? It's like, hey, you can't. And so Samuel's like, really? That's all you got? We've had old prophets in the past. I don't know what the problem is now. And they say, well, yeah, you're old and your boys are out of control. And we've watched this before with other prophets and their boys. When, when the, the kids go out, outside of the will of God, and this is a problem. And Samuel said, well, you do have a point there. And so the elders decided and demanded that they have a king. Check this out. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations. We want to be just like everybody else. Anybody ever get sideways because we use that philosophy of life? Maybe in middle school and high school. Hey, everybody's, do, everybody's going to that party. Everybody's drinking. Everybody's having sex. Everybody's, right, do, experiment. Everybody's doing. Everybody's trying it. And, and I want to be just like everybody. I want to fit in. I want to belong. I don't like this, rule, the rules you got. I want to do my own thing. Now, I am sure, that, you know, Samuel's like, whoa, 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 this is way out of bounds. This is way, and and uh, just, just, like, just like you parents, if your kids are spouting that off to you, and probably they will, you, your job as a parent is to warn them. You're the prophet at this moment saying, whoa, 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 you're heading for a cliff. I know where you're going. That's a bad place to go. Uh, please heed the warning here. And maybe you know that from firsthand experience because you took sideways steps and you went off on, on the deep end and you, you just know, boy, if you keep going there, you're gonna be in trouble. Maybe, you've, maybe it's a family member or a close friend who did that and you're just putting up warning signs. And I think it's your job to do that as a parent and say, whoa, 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 whoa. And just like the nation of Israel, or just like your kids probably, uh, the nation of Israel says, well, We've considered that, but we want to go our own way. Check this out, 1 Samuel 8. Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to the people who were asking him for a king. So he brings this back to God. He's a guy, they're asking for a king, and they're demanding, and they're loud, and they're... And this is how... And this, so he says, this is how a king will reign over you, Samuel said. The king will draft your sons and assign them to his chariots and his charioteers, making them run before his chariots. Some will be generals and captains in his army. Some will be forced to plow his fields and harvest his crops. Some will make his weapons and chariot equipment. The king will take your daughters from you, force them to cook and bake and make perfumes for him. He will take away your best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his own officials. He will take a tenth of your grain and grape harvest and distribute it among his officers and attendants. He will, ta he will take your male and female slaves and demand the finest of your cattle and donkeys for his own use. He will demand a tenth of your flock and, they will be, and, and you will be his slaves. And when that day comes, and you, it will, you will beg for relief from this king you are demanding. But then the Lord will not help you. Is that, that's like, what? I mean, the, so he, Samuel's getting this word from God. And he says, I'm warning you. Here's, the, here's what's gonna happen. And it probably won't happen overnight, but over a course of time, as, as our kings get more and more distant from God. In fact, it didn't even take very long for, for them to get King Saul and then King David and then David's son Solomon becomes king. And what, what did Solomon become? The wealthiest person on planet earth because he extracted all this from the people. Check this out, verse 19. But the people refused to listen to Samuel's warnings even so, we still want a king. We know we're head, we don't care. We don't really care. We want a king. He said, we want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us in a battle. We don't even care. He could take what we want. We want a king more than anything else. But basically, they're saying, God, we don't want you to be king anymore. Appreciate it. But we need somebody we can see and hear and look at. That's what we want. We want to be like every other nation and we can't handle a king we can't see. 
So that's what they did. Even though they knew what life was going to be like. Samuel comes back and, you know, it's like, hey, you know, they, they want a king. Now, I think one of the most difficult verses in the Bible is here, 1 Samuel 8, 22. Because he goes, Samuel goes back and he tells him, tells God. And the Lord replied, do as they say and give them a king. Oof. That's what they want. I mean, think about that. He says, I'm, I'm going to step down as the king of the nation of Israel, and I'm going to give them what they want. I'm not going to demand this. I'm not going to make it. I'm not, if, 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 that, if that's what they want. By the way, he wants to be the king of your life, but if you say to him, I don't want you to be king anymore, he will step down from the throne. If you want to do your own thing, go your own way, call your own shots, be your own king, be boss of your money and your time and your talent and my, you know, all that stuff. If you want to be in charge of all that stuff, you just go ahead. I'm not going to be forcing my way and my love and my grace on you if you don't want it my, or my wisdom or my instruction. If you don't want that, you can go your own way. And many of us have done just that even though we've been warned. And so here's what the nation of Israel is dealing with. And you would think they would say, you know what, Samuel, you're right. I don't know what we're thinking. We're just being selfish. Maybe we were drunk. I don't know. But this sounds horrible, and we want, we want to turn around and go back to God. But they didn't. They were willing to jump off the cliff. So Samuel brings the bad news to them. The nation of Israel had been on a slow drift from God, and now they have a king. Even though Saul was the king, and they chose the king, uh, uh, and again, the way they chose the king was kind of weird. Uh, actually, it wasn't weird at all. They, they chose a king who was good-looking and tall. I don't know who was on the king committee, but it's like, we need a good-looking guy and a tall guy and a strong person. And so they looked for the tallest guy in Israel and the best-looking guy, and they found him, and his name was Saul. And so they're like, you're going to be king because we want a king that looks good on TV. Right? You know, it's like kind of how we, we select our, our leaders is, do they look good? Do they have good haircuts? Stuff like that. Maybe not anymore, but I mean, we, we used to do that. It's like, as long as I have a good haircut, you can, do, you can do that job, can't you? And so here we got a king that's good looking and impressive. But it wasn't very long before this king became thin-skinned and hot-tempered and willing to kill somebody. So much for the People's Choice Award. So now the nation had been on a slow drift from God and they had a godless leader. Their king was not walking with God. Maybe you aren't either. You've gotten this sinking feeling even right now that your life is kind of wrong and you haven't been able to put your finger on it. Now, great God graciously doesn't abandon his people. First Samuel chapter 13, verse 13 says, How foolish, Samuel explained, you have not kept... He, so he's talking to the king, king Saul. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, so if you had done the, if you had kept it, if you had kept the Lord's commandments, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. This little phrase here, man after his own heart, is used twice to describe David. Nobody else got that stamp on, on their life, but David does. And we can learn, a, it's like, what, is it, what does it mean to be a man after God's own heart? What does that look like? Well, I just picked a couple of things that I thought maybe would, we could cover just briefly this morning. Humility, God was looking for a humble person. Psalm 78, 70 says, he chose his servant David, calling him from the sheep pens. And when God calls David to be king. David was just a shepherd boy. He was just taking care of his dad's sheep. He, and again, it's not an impressive job. It's really kind of a smelly one. It's not impressive. It's just kind of like he's, he's a she, sheep farmer and he watches his dad's sheep and that's all. Uh, and again, not impressive. 
Nobody's look, I mean, when God was looking for a king, he wasn't looking for a CEO. He was looking for a shepherd. That's it. Little did David know that watching sheep, he was in training for, to be a king. Again, what does David do to pass the time as a shepherd? Because that's a fairly boring job. I mean, it's basically the same thing. Take the sheep out of the pen, walk them to a field, let them graze around a little bit. That's it. That's all you got. I mean, there's not much to it. I mean, anybody feel like you're in a job kind of like that? You don't have to raise your hand, if you're, especially your boss is here or whatever. Um, it's just like, but it's just the same boring thing over and over and over again. You just think, well, there's not much here. Now, one of David's jobs as a shepherd was to protect the sheep. So his dad says, you got to get better at throwing those rocks with that sling. So every day, David would go out, you know, and fling that rock over, because he's bored. And so he's just making up games. He's hitting that tree over there and that stump over there, and he's swinging that rock, seeing how close he can get to the sheep. So he's just having a good time, over and over and over again, just flinging rocks. Eventually, after a while, a flinging rocks, you get pretty good at it. Now, he didn't know that someday he was going to stand in front of a giant, but he knew that maybe a bear or a lion would come and try to get one of his dad's sheep, and if he could just whack that, she, you know, that, that uh, uh, lion or that bear, he could take care of the problem. So he got really good at it, and the Bible says that he could split a hair off a guy's head. He got so good at flinging the rock. David didn't all of a sudden get superpowers to do that. That God didn't just say, hey, you know what? I want a really good shepherd and a pretty good rock flinger. <laughs> you, no. It was just over and over, discipline day after day, just doing the shepherd thing. I'm not a big fan of theology that suggests that God just gives us superpowers to handle everything. God never changed a diaper for me. He didn't even change a tire or even confront a giant for me. Neither, he didn't do that for David. David rolled up his sleeves and fought for those little sheep. The test of leadership was the day-to-day, in, right? It's not in a spotlight. The test of leadership is not in the spotlight. It's in the every single day doing the same thing over and over just to get better at what you're doing. When nobody else is looking, nobody else was looking for uh, David. is like, hey, you know, hey uh, he was out by himself. You wouldn't think being a shepherd would prepare you to be a king, let alone a warrior, but it did. David was not born into leadership. Another thing that we notice about David was his integrity. Second Chronicles 16, 9 says, The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Psalm 78, 71 says, He took David from tending the ewes and the lambs and made him the shepherd of Jacob's descendants. God's own people, Israel. He cared for them, how? With a true heart and led them with skillful hands. This word here, the true heart, means integrity or completeness, uh, wholesome or honest. God is not necessarily too impressed with externals. He's impressed with inward qualities. Those Those things take time and discipline. The external stuff, God does, he looks way past that. We tend to look on the outside. For the beautiful people, the, the you know, accomplished, the, uh, the powerful, we go, well, that'd make a good leader. We get fooled all the time by people that are impressive on the outside. But God looks on the heart, looking for people of honesty and integrity and loyalty, innocence. Now, David was not perfect, and we're going to see over the next several weeks that David had massive missteps when it comes to following God. And we tend to think, well, how can a guy who got so far messed up a little bit, that, that how did he make his way back to God? And he constantly did. And that's why God could say that he was a man after his own heart. Now, I don't know where your heart is today. Maybe your heart is a lot like those boys that Samuel had. Right now you're in just rebellion. You're greedy. You're going for it. Don't care who's in your way. All right? Maybe that's where you're at. 
And I hope that you will find your way back to God, and you can, but the lessons that you will learn will be difficult. Maybe you're feeling a little bit like the nation of Israel, unsettled with things in your own life and heart, and you're kind of drifting from God, and you're demanding to just kind of live life on your own terms and do your own thing, and kind of fit in and just be like the rest of the crowd that's slowly drifting from God. And you're saying, I, I want to do what everybody else is doing. I want to fit in. I totally get that. I, I want to be a part of the crowd. I want to be popular. I want to be, right? Are you, have, have you noticed, as you, maybe even as you looked in the rear view mirror of your life, the, the, the crowd that you want to be a part of, when you look back and go, man, that got me more heartache than I want to talk about or think about. Maybe you're like King Saul. Just can't wait to be king. Call your own shots, do your own thing, be your own boss. What I hope that we'll discover over the next several weeks is that we would like to have a heart that turns towards God. That what God cares about that I want to care about. That what God's concerned about, I should be concerned about. What God says is holy, I want to be about that as well. If we do so, um, we will see our lives change. All right, let's pray. Thank you, God, so much for your tender mercies. And even though we have taken some steps sideways at times, that you have still uh, shown grace and patience with us. And still to this day, we are thankful for the life of David. As we take a look at him, really what we want to do is take a look at our own heart. For maybe for some of us here today that we are seeking guidance and strength. We would like you now to be king of our, our lives. We're so sorry that we have ripped you off the throne and, and um, put somebody else up there. And declare to you today that we want you to be the king and Lord of our life. That's our prayer. In Christ we pray. Amen.